right, hey, it is that time of the week again, the best Tuesday I've had all week, and it's time for the True Wealth Radio Show, and I am stoked to actually be back in studio. Had like two, three weeks out, one week back, and then the next week get sick and actually don't make it in. Everyone got sick. Yeah, it was really weeks. something. I'm happy to be kind of on the other side of it. They'll know not fully over it, still kind of clearing really? the, still a cough that's clearing, but I mean, I'm, my energy is largely better and stuff. But mm -hmm. man, I mean, like in the middle of July in a heat wave and still pulling that off, come on. I know, that never happens. I'm like, that's eh, no fun. Mm -hmm. So anyway, but I'm glad to be here and Matt, uh, I'm glad you're here too. Yeah. So, um, I guess we we're gonna you know we're gonna talk about money today and finance Perfect. and stuff, but maybe not directly is okay. as, as I understand. Okay. Um, as I'm looking at, so let, let me just, uh, just mean, for all of our what, listeners, what's, what's the news cycle around <laughs> lately? Like we gotta we gotta ride the coattails. So on this thing. so here's what happens a little bit. Okay, um, there's there's some show prep for sure. Yeah. Right? But it's a variety show. We talk about a lot of stuff and it's kind of like, well, what's relevant and what comes up as we talk? But we often start with a theme. Now, Matthew yeah. likes a good theme. I do. And I'm like, how do we go on the radio show and not talk about what everyone else is talking about? Right? Like, Impossible. It, so, we can do it. <laughs> we, like, we, we could, all know that someone, but we won't. Yeah. Uh, and, and a lot of this, I think, interestingly enough, I kind of stayed out of the way and said, well, what is interesting to you today? Yeah, well, so I looked at this and I'm like, well, obviously we're financial advisors, right? And so... Weird, yes. Yeah, we are always looking at the market. And when the assassination attempt took place, um, in the hours that followed that, you know. Hint, this is kind of part of the topic, just it is, so you know. Yeah. Matt, Matt just totally dropped it without dropping it, right? I, I did. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, kind of reeling on what just happened, and then my mind goes to, well, what's the stock market going to think about an assassination attempt? And what what's going on throughout the world? So I started looking at the different markets, right, because... Um, the Asian stock market, I think, was trading when that happened, mm -hmm. if I remember right. And then Europe is trying to figure and sort everything out. Um, and typically, the stock market moves really quickly to news cycles. And so I'm starting to do research, like, what's going to happen when things open? Um, I'm smiling right now because I'm going to hijack the heck out of Matt's show. Are you really? Oh, okay. oh yeah. Yeah, you're going to love yeah. this. And Maybe. so, Maybe not. Um, you know, my initial gut reaction was, well, surely the markets aren't going to like the uncertainty of the political tensions and all the concern. So surely the markets are going to open lower, right? No. They didn't. Monday comes around, and there was a pretty good day in the markets. And then today was a really good day mm -hmm. across the board for the most part. And so um, there was a you know a jump in volatility, like which is just kind of a measure of like um, how About uncertain how wide the trading yeah. range is. That's kind of yeah. what volatility means in the short term. Is like oh well the spread up or down increased. Mm -hmm. Right, and we did see that happen. Um, and so then what I wanted to bring to the show today was, I mean, we've had assassination attempts in the past. And, it's been a while, but yeah. Yeah, and so what happened back then in the stock market? What happened this time? And kind of what can we expect as investors moving forward? Okay. And I'm going to hijack try to bring, that. I'm going to hijack that. I'm going to try to bring some different perspective to it because I think the, uh, the news cycle way to do this is, well, you know, what does this mean and well, for the markets, mm -hmm. right? But the, uh, <laughs> I'm reminded of like the really stupid accidental meme uh, in Avengers when it's like, you know, where's Gamora? What's Gamora? You know, or no, who, you know, then who? And then somebody goes like, what is, or why is Gamora? You're like, what? <laughs> and, but really, there's <laughs> kind of a hidden, oh, that's a dumb reference. Um, you, know, you just uh, had a nerd moment. That's I okay. just, I just, it, yeah. I think the issue I'm trying to get at is sometimes we don't necessarily know the right question to ask. So let me ask a different question to you before we go too deep into the rabbit hole of mm -hmm. like past, um, assassination attempts and so forth. First, what did you observe in the markets in the hours following this assassination attempt? So, I mean, 
what I'm going to even detour off that slightly. Um, one of the things that I saw, obviously, um, there, the Asian markets in particular, we saw a lot of money not flowing into um, into the U.S. There was a pretty big downturn in how much money was coming okay. into the U.S. So that's uh, how, that that's an observable thing as we yeah. saw a change in trend where less money was moving into the U.S. Okay. Yeah. What um, else? We also saw, um, like I already mentioned, the volatility really okay. rose. So, so, so volatility rose. Mm -hmm. yeah. By the way, I, I, like because I'm, I'm asking these questions to Matt, yeah. I got to give him a little grace here because like, I didn't prep him for this. No. Right? Well, and when stocks opened, and it was because I noticed it because it was a company that I owned personally, mm -hmm. um, there, was a, there was a defense contract company that supplies ammunition, and it was up like 20% that morning. Yep. And so I'm like, well, that's weird. Why is that up? And then I look, and a lot of gun manufacturers were up 10% that day. And yep. so that actually caught me off guard, surprisingly. OK, so this is, uh, one, I think this is interesting for our, our particular, particular demographic mm -hmm. of listeners locally. Yeah. You know, and if you're watching this on video, remember that you're watching a radio show, and we have a local audience. And so we live in a rural community, and it's a pretty strong Second Amendment community. Yeah. Okay, and so that's just part of the culture here. If you're in an urban area listening to this, I'm just gonna tell you, you probably don't get it. Well, right? I yeah. mean, you just, you're just not gonna get it because of the nature of your world is different. But so, do you want me to tell you why it caught me off guard? Sure. So, I look back in time and I think back to like when Obama was president, for example. There were a lot of, um, there was a lot of uncertainty about gun regulation and, you know, would there be sweeping gun laws that would make guns more scarce, ammunition more scarce? People were panic buying, right? Mm -hmm. And so we saw gun sales go through the roof. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I noticed, even in, in the betting odds, because you can bet on who's going to win the presidential election. Right. The, the actual line swung largely towards Trump, where he might have been an underdog before. Now he was a, like right. the which, favorite to win Which, just as the an election. aside, what that means is they're balancing the, the book. book. Yeah. It doesn't mean that the probabilities really change. No. It means that the way the betting is occurring. Right. A lot of money's coming yeah, in on Trump Yeah, a bunch of win. money came to yeah. a different side of the betting book, and so the odds changed. Right. That's and what that means. It's exactly what it means. Right. Yeah. So, 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 you know, gambling books hedge. They do. Okay. And so, so that's what we just learned. We didn't learn that the odds necessarily no. change, but go on. So, yeah. So we see this swing in momentum, right? Um, and kind of a belief on what's going to happen when the elections come around. And I would have thought the opposite. Well, if a Republican takes office and maybe has gun measures that are a little bit more, um, liberal and what you can buy and there's not that scarcity concern you would think that the gun manufacturers and the ammo manufacturers would have slid in trading but yeah. they didn't so let me play a game with you okay? Let's play and i'm game. not going to overly lead the witness i'm just going to yeah. kind of talk through what if after an assassination attempt there's already been some question about how like civil unrest no how strongly was president trump going to back the second amendment mm -hmm. then experiences a shot from an ar style rifle true at himself at a rally personally right personally mm -hmm. does that that make him more it. nervous about guns and say, hey, I, someone shot at me. We got to get serious here. Mm -hmm. At which point, maybe less committed to the Second Amendment right. from a purist perspective. And so if you were handicapping with that in mind, the opposite could occur. It's true. Yeah. Right. And this is why I feel like you cannot predict. Well, the remember, future. it takes you, two players to make a market. You yeah. Buyer and a seller. And so when you're trying to handicap on this stuff, that's what makes it so challenging. Is that it really does the market has only so much information. Now, this this is a really interesting time to what we should do. Let, in fact, let's just we'll we'll take a pause to come back to this specific idea. Right. So the specific idea I want to return to is. The efficient market hypothesis sounds super nerdy, but it's not inherently super nerdy as much as it means something, okay? I'm ready for it. Right, and so what it means 
and what can we deduce from it and then how might we understand market volatility? Okay, I've got something to add to that because we did see something happen today that really changed and I, I'm going to leave it at that. We saw a big change today. All right. Well, that was, so stick around. When we come back, we're going to talk more about the efficient market hypothesis and what everything means. Okay. Until then, we'll be right back. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you got True Wealth on News Radio 939 FM and 1240 KQEN. Hey, gang, welcome back to the True Wealth Radio Show. I'm your host, Dave Littlejohn. This is Matt Dixon. And if you want to catch us, you can grab the podcast later by going to littlejohnfs.com and looking under the Educate section. Let's get that out of the way really quickly so we get back to what matters, which is the efficient market hypothesis. Yes. Which is, <laughs> drum roll please, Yeah. basically is, everything that's known about the stock is priced in. The stock market's already, it knows. Yeah. And so therefore it, it's reflected in the price. It is a theory that the price of a stock already reflects all known information. Now, if that theory were to be true, and I'm not saying it is, but let's pretend it is, and then somebody takes a shot at a presidential candidate, mm, that kind what of, changed? Everything? <laughs> all the things changed, right? right? That's a pretty hard thing for the market to re-handicap. Mm -hmm. And so it scrambles yeah. to readjust. Yeah, and, and it's hard to re-handicap because, now what are some of the things that have come out of this. I mean, the, the rhetoric isn't as simple as there was a failed attempt at the president. Right. There's all sorts of talks about was this an inside job? Like, oh, yeah. Like, did you let the guy get on the roof? And so there's a, obviously a huge investigation right. to see you well, know, and, and what happened. There's, there's so many problems because, like, was it incompetence? Mm -hmm. That's a problem. Was it malevolence? That's a problem. What about the collateral damage? That's a problem. Yeah. Right? People, People died. died. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Let's not forget that part. Right. And, you know, and then there's even discussion about the folks may have known about the shooter well in advance and yeah. they couldn't like get their act together to, to get minutes. it taken care of. Yeah. Like, hey, there's a guy with a gun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and so this is really fascinating. A friend of mine's talking about, uh, he's been in the telecommunications industry for a while. Uh, if he's listening, he'll, you, you know, if you know, you know, right? Anyway, he says, look, I've been involved and in, in, in telecommunications. And one of the things that's interesting is companies like, uh, and I'll just say, like in the, his examples, like Motorola, mm -hmm. will sell a, a high-end secure communication system to a branch of government. And then they will sell a different system to another branch of government that's proprietary and they don't actually crosstalk. We assume that everything connects right. to each so other, you're, but they yeah. don't because it's a way to sell multiple contracts. Right. So the police might have been on a whole different system that doesn't system. patch together with Secret Service, right? right? So that's the issue. And if the Secret Service has the National Guard there, the National Guard may have their own system that's mm -hmm. different than theirs. Right. And you go, wow. So we're all issued equipment that doesn't crosstalk natively. What? Right. And then there's so many other things to think about too. Like, do we actually know what the building looked like that the guy was on? Because some people are saying that there was a slant to the roof and that even if a guy was on top of it, the snipers next to Trump's stage couldn't have seen him anyway. Yeah, so, which I don't buy simply because you should have had that information prior to the event ever occurring. So it would never have been like, surprise, mm -hmm. here we are doing this event and this is an unsecure location. Right, that would be a huge, huge overlook. Well, again, it goes back to incompetence yeah. or willful negligence. One or worse the, would be yeah. a full-blown setup. Right. And I wouldn't put it past at this point. To, if it was a setup, it could have been because a person was more or less extorted into creating a hole in the, the security because like somebody takes their kid hostage or something. You know, right. they find an exploit and that person doesn't want to do it. It's not like their their desire was for that, but it's like if you don't let this happen, bad things happen to you. And if you ever say anything, bad things happen to you. Right? Right. So they can be extorted into something like that. Yeah. Okay. And so so all these things, I'm not saying they are these things. But you're saying, I'm it saying could it's be. it's not out of the possible the realm of possible. Right. So, of course, the market has to go, blah, 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 yeah. which is the technical way of saying, oh, crap, I don't know what to do with this. Yeah, well, what's interesting to me in all of this is you look back on um, the assassination attempt to Ronald Reagan, right, mm -hmm. and JFK, and you mm -hmm. look at kind of what happened then. So, like, you look at JFK, for example, and there was a huge downturn in the markets following that. Mm -hmm. um, markets were down almost 3% that day, and... But what's odd is in all of these circumstances, the market rebounded 
pretty robustly and pretty quickly in mm -hmm. all of these attempts. And we even, I mean, we didn't even see a downturn on in this event. Uh, markets started high and they've moved higher. Well, and of course, it was an attempt. It wasn't successful. That's true. So yeah. there, that's that's number one. Is that it but ended up being when, a alert, but not an alert. Right. But even after the Reagan attempt back in '81, the S&P was down two percent. Um, but it also recovered those losses within a month. So here's um, the thing that I I just cannot help but bring up. Yeah. Um, what do you think is one of the primary differences structurally between today and back then? I would say just information moves so quickly, yeah. right? Like it, computers are doing a lot of yeah, the trading. Yeah, pre-internet. Pre, um, yeah, Right. Exactly. I mean, I think that there's a really, I, I almost think that you must look at. Um, the structure of the way that the market well, is. Well, the now. way the market yeah. moves, so, so I, you know, and I'll just, I've said this for a long time. I should probably write a book about it and do homework to really get interesting in it. But consider that before the internet, the speed of information, and then once we had the internet, the way information changed, how it quickly it moved, and then we start looking at how it, the, the speed of information accelerated. So you know, you mm -hmm. went from pre-internet, you did memos. Post-internet, you did email. Right. Instant communication, right? And then after that, you went to from dial-up to broadband to wireless broadband. Mm -hmm. And so we went from starting to pick up speed to starting to put it everywhere to ubiquitous access largely across the United States. Now, that's not actually true, but it's for all intents and purposes true that you can be essentially anywhere you need to be and have broadband internet connectivity. With Starlink, you pretty well can. Mm -hmm. So it's amazing how fast information can now move. And so if we use that as a backdrop to understand some of the market movements, it wasn't as efficient then as it is today. Right. And those little kind of quirks in the market often work themselves out. Like I mentioned, a stock jumped 20% on the news. Mm -hmm. Well, today it was down 5%. And so it's coming back to kind of where yeah. it was. And so it's like that information is coming through, things settle quickly, and then we're kind of almost back to where yeah. we were. Well, some of the information is rumor, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So you know what the market knows about a stock? Rumors, right? And if those rumors turn out to be false, you know what it now knows? It was a false rumor. And then but it it's still adjusting yeah. the price. Yeah, yeah exactly. so like it not just because it, it, the efficient market hypothesis suggests that everything that's known about a stock is in there, but it doesn't mean that all the knowledge is correct. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Which is why I think one can argue maybe it's not actually an efficient market. Maybe we're arguing about semantics of like, well, the information the market's choosing to use mm -hmm. is what's reflected right now, and it doesn't know the future. No, but it can guess, right? And we saw and that. It, it's, it does it's guess. guessing on regulation. Oh, yeah. Largely. And we have seen that with this shift in thought that Trump might actually get reelected now. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen certain segments of the stock market kind of flourish and start to improve. And then, you know, oddly, we've actually seen tech kind of pull back a little bit. Some of the bigger tech companies, they've, yeah. they haven't been doing quite as strong, I guess, as some of those smaller companies. Well, I find um, that just, that story's interesting that there's assets, you know, money sort of rotating out of mm -hmm. some of the biggest tech companies and right. rolling into smaller tech companies. Mm -hmm. Now, what it remains to be seen if that's actually a good sign or not, but I interpret that as a good sign that the market movement is becoming more broad-based and not just contained in a, the seven biggest stocks on yeah. the planet. Yeah. So, you know, we'll see. I did see, or I did notice, uh, that oil and coal both got a, a little bit of a rally with mm -hmm. the news that um, Trump has now kind of moved into the, the favorite position here to um, yeah. win the election. So and That is the that, most correlated to the idea that yeah. the handicapping is now favoring right. Trump more. It's like, well, if he's going to, you know, renew some leases that maybe didn't get renewed before, sure, yeah. that makes sense. That's that's yeah. something. They are that, very different policies and for different they are. reasons. Yeah. Um, and I guess, I don't know, I mean, I don't really like to poke it like politics a ton, like on a partisan basis here, right? Mm -hmm. Like you kind of get their energy independence um, rapidly 
is hard to do. I mean, like, you're not going to do it without fossil fuels when we talk rapid. Yeah. Um, long term, is it good to cl you know be environmentally aware and, and you know clean things up? I just don't see the downside to it. But right. the idea that we could somehow flip a switch and like we'd stop burning oil tomorrow mm -hmm. or coal tomorrow, like not without severe pain, right? And not without right. like famine because like we can't even run farm equipment. We'd starve if we did that. So there there is a pragmatic approach to say you know we, we do need to. If, even if that's our desire, we got to figure out how to do that at a price point and an infrastructure point that doesn't kill us yeah. in the process. Here's something I want to throw at you, pick your brain on. So, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier in the show. So, foreign investment in the U.S. markets. Yeah. Once this all happened, it's a lot more than you might think. It slowed down 15% immediately following the attempt. Mm -hmm. And so, when we've talked about this a little bit on prior shows, the trade volume was way down. Yeah. And so, so yeah, what are the implications there? What do you well, think it's kind of what is it suggesting? What that tells me is there's a lot less buyers and sellers. So the mm -hmm. gap between what someone's willing to pay on the top end and what someone is willing to sell could widen. Mm -hmm. And then you could see bigger price movements in stocks could. as a percentage. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's an interesting one. Is the you know the depth of the market? Mm -hmm. um, is this just a snapshot in time with fear surrounding right. it? Yeah. A in which case we would see some more normalization in the coming days and weeks. Right. Uh, you know, I suspect we probably will, but uh, certainly foreign policy does come into play. And mm -hmm. when you consider, right, like because the U.S. currency going to get stronger or weaker, well, that's going to have a major sway. Like you just said, Trump and Biden have very different approaches to global politics. Oh yeah. Yeah. Right, and the way that they handle um, things on a global scale. And so I think foreign investors, which that has a big pull on the market, how are they viewing the United States right now? And that's something I think that is worth monitoring. And keep in mind, it's not just foreign investors like, oh, are there people in Europe or China that are like buying U.S. stocks in their right. retirement plans? And I think we're talking about like institutional and yes. sovereign wealth and yeah. that kind of money is like, big, big dollars and mm -hmm. where it's moving in the system, right? right? That's what I'm looking yeah, at. Yeah, I mean, but as, again, as an aside to this point, I mean, this is one of the large issues with when people say, oh, the U.S. is going to be kicked out, they're not going to be the reserve currency anymore. And uh, my, so my answer is yeah. like, well, that, there's a lot of countries that would prefer to be the, US, the reserve currency versus sure, the U.S. dollar. Sure, they'd love to. It's going to take some time because there's not other currencies around that are currently deep enough. I mean, there's not enough in circulation to yep. really be able to accommodate a reserve status right now. Mm -hmm. And so, do, do people want to change that, or are there, you know, uh, the folks that are kind of angling that direction? Yeah, I suspect so. But it's not something where you're just going to be like, oh, you know what? If we screw this thing up, boom, it's over, just like that. Like, well, it's it will unravel. Right. But it's not just going to be a, we flipped a switch more than likely. And that would require some weird stuff. Like We're not going to wake up one day and be like, you know what? Bitcoin. Let's just do it. Yeah. Like, no. And uh, here's, a, I think, a big misconception that a lot of people, especially who live in the United States, have. It's like they look at things. Inflation has been a, you know, causing a heavy burden on a lot of people. And we have this uh, just kind of natural opinion that, well, things are bad, right? Mm -hmm. Like things are tough. But if you start to actually look at the economic data, it's like, well, how is GDP? It's doing pretty good. Like, the economy's actually not doing <laughs> bad on paper. So it's like. <laughs> on paper, on paper. Right. And it so drives me like, nuts. Every time you create a government job, that goes to GDP. Right. But it also builds debt. I know. Right, you can't print money, it's and it turns tough. out printing government jobs does yep. increase GDP, yep. but it adds to the debt. It, right, and that's something I don't think we talk about either. We right? don't. Because we don't. what is the largest growing segment of our economy? Government. Government jobs. Yeah. And, 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 like, and I often remind uh, folks, remember, the government is like um, that plant from Little Shop of Horrors, mm -hmm. right? Feed me, right? And it gets bigger and bigger until it, like, consumes everything around it. Yeah, all the other plants just Yeah, I mean, consumed. the government does, it, it. it's fed by the private sector. Well, and then the private sector companies that are dependent on the government payouts, right? Yeah. That starts to get a little muddy too because the government doesn't want to see this private company fail because they get so much stuff from that company. Right. So then you see the bailout money and then it well, just, it, and then know, the problem gets worse. It's, it's, yeah, there's so many layers. You get into the fact that unions 
look to set minimum labor costs, mm -hmm. and then the largest companies have unions, so they set minimum labor costs, and then it gets legislated to increase minimum labor costs, and then small businesses have to also pay those labor costs. But at some point, you it doesn't all get passed on. I mean, yes, it does, but some of it gets passed on in the form of less consumer choice because companies simply fail because and, and this is the lost point, right? Mm -hmm. Not every business scales, right? The mom and pop shop that rely on the stable cost of everything get priced out of business when you add more uh, regulatory burdens, right? We talk about this in our office. This is just an aside for our firm, right? Mm -hmm. People would say, why are you still taking on new clients and still growing? Right? And there are a number of reasons, not to at least at which include, I think, healthy things grow, and if you're doing a good job, you want to keep growing. But as more and more financial regulations show up, consumers see two choices occur. Either you run to the path of do-it-yourself using very low-cost structures, where you buy a chassis from somebody and you're shopping for the lowest cost for that chassis that's acceptable to you, mm -hmm. right? Great, go buy index funds, set it and forget it, You know, pay a dollar a year for your account or whatever it is, and then just wait 30 years, wake up and hope everything works out. But you're literally on your own. You have to f do the phone calls or online, everything is directed by you. Right. Or you try to work with an advisor so that they can help you and guide you and try to you know plan with you and make you more efficient but then you see the minimum account sizes go up more and more and more and more and that's because the cost to stay legal continues to rise mm -hmm. and so you either add more customers so that you can have enough revenue to pay for all the additional personnel to stay legal right mm -hmm. that's the legal compliance side of things uh, you make the customers that you do have, you keep kind of moving up market so that you have more wealthy customers but nobody else can afford to work with you. Some combination of the two, or you end up going away. Right? And you yeah. see, because the, the most dangerous model, this is just, I don't know how we got here, but I'm going to just say that the toughest model I see in financial services and insurance is, hey, a young person gets started, bring all your family and friends over, try to make a living at it, and then when you fail, some of those customers are going to stick with the company for a while, and that's how they're going to make their money. Hmm. They're counting on attrition of the, the sales force. Bring in the sales force, they build some people up. When the salesman fails out, then a, a senior person will absorb those relationships and try to press on, and that's how the companies build. Mm. And I don't like it. Yeah, like I, I, I hate to see it. I think it's a way that you burn people out, and I think that it's kind of abuse of the family and friends model. But it's going nowhere. Yeah, right. It's a tried and true, and it's going nowhere. So anyway, we're off the off the main subject here, especially from an assassination attempt to you know fail business models. But um, now you know. Yeah. Well. Okay, so if we want to get out of the weeds, I, I'm curious, would you let me pick your brain to play the what if game? So what if Trump were to get reelected? I'm kind of curious, do you have any like predictions on where the market might kind of venture? Like what sectors might see an increase? Um, where might money move in the markets if we well, have I a change mean of administration? globally, nationally, kind of talking about the whole big broad spectrum? Yeah, I mean, I, I joke because I don't know anything, right? right. But can we make did, educated did you stay guesses and talk about yeah, it? Yeah, did you stay at a Holiday Inn Express? Yeah, let's, why not? Let's okay. give it a shot. But um, there, I'm looking at the clock right now. We're running long, so we got to grab a break. All right. So we'll do that. Stick around. When we come back, um, I play lightning round with Matt, and we'll see what we figure out. I like it. All right, stick around. I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. And you got True Wealth on News Radio 93.9 FM and 1240 KQEN. <laughs> <laughs> Twitch, I go like, I really, I, I don't, I don't know anything, man. But I, but you did stay at a Holiday Inn. I mentioned I, that. Yeah. <laughs> well, every time you get caught in these prediction games, I'm like, all right. So what'll really be fun is replay to come back to this, this yeah. and replay it and be it like, be. all right, well, we shot in the dark. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> Typically, when we take shots in the dark, I'd say we hit maybe sixty percent. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of these. I mean, sometimes they're like fall down questions, right? Yeah. Like, hey, you know, will the market still be around? It's like, yeah. Still working. Oh yeah. Thank you. Um 
<laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of those where it's like, you know, will gravity still be here? It's like, yes, because if it's not, we all die, so right? I, ha I have a theory as to what might have happened. This what? is like just me pulling this out of my own head. You're, so, you're, Are you talking about the assassination yeah. deal here? So, okay, we're gonna totally let the cameras roll because this could be fun. So here's my theory. If Biden and his administration send tons and tons of money to Ukraine, right? Someone's making a ton of money. And we all know that not all of it's going to Ukraine. A lot of it's going to certain politicians, certain areas that are outside of Ukraine. We all know that. That's public. Oh, yeah. That's it's, public. It's just laundered. We don't know where to, we but don't it's know, just yeah. gone. So my question is, maybe it was as simple as someone didn't want to lose that. Cause the thought process in my mind is Trump gets in, we're probably not going to be writing blank checks to Ukraine anymore. Yeah. If that happens, someone stands to lose a ton of money. Mm -hmm. That person would want him dead. And whoever that one person is probably set something up to try and get him snuffed. Easy as that. Yeah. I mean, it's a it's, it's, it's just a perfectly the reasonable theory. Follow actually. the dollar. As crazy, I mean, like it, it's because it's not as crazy as it's it's actually a viable theory. Yeah. Um, it's one hundred percent speculative, right? Like it we is. don't have any evidence no. or anything other than like what we've seen. And like at this point, if I've seen it on the TV or the internet, then I know I haven't seen all of it. Yep. Right. I have yeah. seen the story they're giving me. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what to make of that. Well, the only thing that they keep reporting is they've scrubbed his phone in the internet searches, and he had no radical political affiliations. So either he I go got, back to somebody takes his sister hostage or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Or you know, a, or they don't even have to. They just yeah. say, "Do see you want to be pictures? famous?" Yeah. No, you see these pictures? Yeah. We know where they are. Yeah. We're watching them right now. We can see them right here. We have their location, everything. Yep. If you don't do this, you'll, there's going to be an accident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It yeah. doesn't have to be anything radical. Yeah, I mean, people sometimes say, hey, why don't you ever consider running for office? And I'm like, it, 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 with you kids at home, yeah. I, I'm really actually afraid of what could happen to them. Yeah. And I'm like, Local politics less so. I mean, there's going to be people that get their feelings hurt, but they don't usually pull guns. Right. But, I mean, like even our founding fathers, God, there was a lot of duels and people died. Like, mm -hmm. what's the story there? Right. Like, it gets violent. Yeah. So I guess it's dangerous to be a politician. I don't know. Yeah, too much money on the line. Yeah. All right. Welcome back to the True Well Show. Um, you're going to have to catch the videos if you want to hear the, the off the behind here. the scenes theories and yeah, deep the, dives. Yeah, like what's going on uh, and uh, news flash, though. We're just guessing. We don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and honestly, we got the information from the news, so it's, uh, we only got so much information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that, that narrative is, it, is alive and well. Um, well, do you want to make more guesses and more shots in the dark? Sure. Dungeon? As long as nobody's holding me accountable, let's do it. Okay. Right. right. Now, this, by the way, uh, this the, is the not this, investment this, advice. This next segment is not investment advice of any kind, and we reserve the right to be completely wrong. Yeah. Well, let me let me just start in one sector. I'm just going to throw a sector out, and then you're going to tell me what your thoughts are. Uh, are you ready? Okay. Sure. All right. And if you want me to start, I can. But energy. What are your thoughts on the theory of? Trump gets elected, what happens to energy? Ooh, um, leading up to election, energy mm -hmm. probably does better if we have growing economy. Um, initially speaking, probably volatile, maybe even down. Okay. Reason being that um, if we have a more liberal energy policy, probably drives oil prices lower. That's which is yeah. not necessarily a driver of energy stocks higher. Now, yeah. the the fact that it might be a little easier to, to put in place infrastructure, so like pipelines might be interesting because you could see something like Anwar back on the table or Keystone Pipeline back on yeah. the table. So those are those are but things. But you're that talking could be the actual cost of oil could go down I and mean, we did yeah, see if we, that if we cut Trump, red tape yeah. or we start increasing the number of leases and um, uh, that are available domestically to produce power and we saw an increase in domestic production it could drive the prices but low. if I'm Jerome Powell and I'm the Fed and I'm looking at this thing and I'm like well cheap oil yeah, that it, could bring inflate. That could help in a huge way bring inflation down. It it, it could bring inflation down uh, because the cost of all these goods. I mean, it's well, got to get it, it shipped. Well, it could bring right? energy prices lower. And so, if, but yeah. that doesn't necessarily. 
Yeah, probably. The input cost goes down, yeah. and so that could uh, stabilize pricing a little bit. Because, you know, inflation's been very challenging. But, but keep in mind, a lot of the inflation is, it's not just energy prices, it's not just input costs. It's the amount of dollars in circulation, right? Yep. So if you reduce the money supply, then you tend to reduce inflation. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, we want so we actually want a little bit of inflation if we don't want right. the banking system destabilized, but we don't want the kind of inflation we've experienced the last few years, and we definitely want a handle on the total picture of inflation. Like, stop telling me like, oh, what uh, inflation was only three point one percent. We're doing fine, but then foods double. I'm like that ain't working. Here's an area that I am completely. I don't know if ignorant is the right word, but I just don't have an opinion on which way it could go. What about infrastructure spending? I haven't looked at the numbers. I haven't kind of done the compare and contrast between what Biden's actually done for infrastructure, nor have I really looked at what Trump has done for infrastructure. Well, so that's an interesting one. I think infrastructure is a, a pretty broad term. Yeah. And so that's the thing that I wonder about. Um, my like like. Trump's talked a lot about like we need roads, bridges, and airports. He you know, has that everything's kind of worn that, down, and yeah. so we need to uh, put more resource, resources toward that. Um, but you know, roads are f state as well as federal, so I it's know. not that That's simple. A tough one, yeah. Um, uh, my suspicion is that Trump, from an economics perspective, like when we had last time, there wasn't money printing, but there was still like government spending as mm -hmm. a form of. Well, we uh, saw it on the border. There was a lot of construction going on. Now, was it completely finished? No. No, but, but I, I think that um, Trump being kind of a real estate builder guy mm -hmm. and, and seeing. I mean, the one thing about government that's interesting is it doesn't get to depreciate things. Like when it pays for something, it just writes a check and it's done. Yeah. So I say, like, if it buys an aircraft carrier, it just has a cost in the year that it does it. It doesn't um, yeah. spend it and then depreciate it over 50 years for its lifespan. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, infrastructure is an interesting one. It definitely would increase deficit spending. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, would it improve GDP if that were put in place? And so uh, I, I lean towards, you know, if we really did spend it on infrastructure and we didn't spend it on unions and bloat, mm -hmm. that um, it would be good. But I, I, I'm kind yeah. of with you. It's like I just am so suspect or suspicious about it yeah. being really pulled off that I'm like, eh, I don't know. Here's one that's a weird one to me also is the defense spending. Because everyone says, well, you know, Trump is a huge proponent of the military and spending there. And I look at this and I'm like, well, let's also not forget what where Biden's been spending, right? Like we yeah. have seen a huge, you know, surge from companies like Raytheon who have been, you know, f sending missiles to uh, Israel and they've been sending missiles to um, Ukraine. We've also seen, you know, a lot of um, activity over um, in Europe with U.S ships that have been dealing with the stuff, the Houthis in Yemen. And we've been using a lot of missiles every day to try and ward off attacks. And so I'm like, well, I know we're spending a lot on defense now. Are we going to be spending more if Trump gets into office? I really can't tell. I, I have a hard time predicting that. It's a toughie because part of it is, I, I, I feel like anytime you have a budget that big, that um, there are areas that you could be more efficient, period, mm -hmm. right? And one of the things about government that I don't know how to solve is the issue that um, when a government spends money, if it does not spend it, it tends not to be reapportioned the next time. So mm -hmm. that sort of is held against a government like agency. It encourages more and more spending. Yeah, so essentially yeah. you have to spend all of it so that you get reapportioned that and then some more next time. Yeah. So it, it, it sort of incentivizes aggressive spending and not looking for sales, right? And, and the other thing is that the government largely operates under the premise of like a prevailing wage and so forth. So it's going to, it's never going to look for the low bid per se. It's going to look for the bid that follows the parameters that sort of meet what the government perceives as fairness doctrine. Right. So those all add to cost. Mm -hmm. And and you know, we, we just know too, like when was the last time we had a defense contractor that stayed on budget, right? It's like, yeah. oh we're gonna build a plane, but they were change orders. And now by the time we're done with it, that plane's two, three times more than we ever thought it would be. <laughs> and what do you well we'll just stop if you want. And we're like, well no, we spent this much. We gotta finish. So right. you know it's 
kind of silly. All right, well, I've grilled you on defense, energy, and infrastructure. What mm -hmm. just talk to me freely, I guess, about kind of some other areas that your mind goes to when you think about how policies might change or how um, the economy might shift mm -hmm. slightly? Well, I, I think there's two big regimes kind of playing out here. One of them is more of a globalist regime and one of them is more of a nationalist regime. Um, neither means that you're exclusively one or the other, right? But globalist regime, I think about it more like, let's try to coordinate both our policies and our uh, the, the the compliance and regulation so that it's happening at an international level. Let's let's try to you know create global carbon standards, for example. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so if we get everybody to behave a certain way, then you know we'll all be better off. And so that is a different tack. And 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 the reason this is sort of challenging is we're not all starting at the same place, right? We have a disparate resources, and so then people try to say, well, then why don't we try to rebalance the resources too, and we'll shift from those with more to those with less to try to make this all work. And um, it sounds nice, but then you end up with the argument of like, well, why is it that we can send bazillions of dollars overseas and our veterans are starving? Right? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a valid question. Uh, then the, the flip side of it is the concept of more of a nationalist, which is we're less concerned about the global standards. You other countries are going to do which is best for you, and we're going to fix to kind of do what's best for us, and when we can get along and help, and when it's in our interest, we will. Yeah, and I think just my natural disposition on that, the United States tends to want to try and drive or be the influential figure in global policy and changing the way that the world does things, right? Well, it's, it's and, a mixed bag if you consider economically speaking. Mm -hmm. It's probably in our interest to be at the tip of the spear driving global economic influence. Right? I mean, that's yeah. probably true. And, and we have a lot of... Uh, alliances with other countries where they essentially rent our military from us, right? So they don't carry much of a but military they don't really presence. Pay for it. Well, they don't, but they do in like like Japan doesn't have a significant military presence, mm -hmm. but they have a very strong alliance with us post World War II, mm -hmm. right? So uh, the Marshall Plan and rebuilding them and maintaining diplomatic relations, we sort of do the military thing and we get cooperation from each other. So they don't need a significant military because we're allies. Right. And in return, they do some things that we can't and vice versa, and we're relatively decent trade partners. Yeah. Right. And they so send us a few Hondas. Right. And, and so, <laughs> and, and there's always going to be a little bit of a push and pull because they're still sovereign. They can do their own thing. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a purely like do what we say relationship. It's a, can we all agree that this is still kind of the thing which we want to do? And sometimes it's like, no, we can't agree. And somebody goes, can we agree because we have this leverage? And then they go, yeah, I guess we can agree. Mm -hmm. Right, and then, so that's sort of foreign policy. It's like a right. lot of times you don't get what you want. The United States can be the bully a lot of the time, and I think we sometimes take advantage of that. But there's a no bit, question right? that the United States is a bully at times. Yeah. Right, sometimes being a bully though is probably in the world's best interest. It sounds arrogant, right? That that sounds like the kind of comment you'd say. Well, you know, you're an elitist for saying that, um, and I and I would say that is kind of an elitist comment. However, I'm referencing primarily human rights issues, where the United States yeah. is like, look, we're going to be champions of human rights, and other countries are not. Mm -hmm. And I go, well, it may be elitist, but I don't care. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so I love that you don't have fall. to apologize for that one. You're like, well, it's true. So yeah, yeah. there you go. Um, so anyway, those are the two bigger regimes that I think we're seeing here. Um, I, I don't it, see a... a a domestic focused or uh, you know more of a nationalist regime being anti-global but just being look we need oh, to take care of our own first. Are you saying that you think if Trump gets in he'll I think be Trump's more nationalist okay. for sure. Yeah. You know and and I, I just I also I think he's uh, much stronger in terms of foreign policy and saying let's just have a big stick rather than have a war shall we? Mm -hmm. So I, I think that he's he's much more willing to do that to kind to of throw do some threats out on the table and it's yeah. like well you might look like a bully or act like one right. but and yeah. But but I also think that tends to stabilize our economy somewhat if mm -hmm. we're more energy independent um, and so you know I think what we saw before we'd see kind of a trend toward that hopefully minus a pandemic. Yeah. That would be nice, right. uh, because that was not fun to go through. No doubt. Um, I think we have one last break. I'm looking oh at the clock. Gosh, I think we we're do. scrambling. We do, yeah. Yeah. Oh, 
and it turns out, well, there's some kind of, um, what do we call it? Uh, uh, it sounds like a, a warning. Run. There's like a warning oh. going on. So I, again, those of you on the recording, we're waiting on, hey, this is just you know, an emergency broadcast. Oh. So, it sounds like, I don't know what we just got, but there we go, and the beeps. This will make for a very interesting edit later, guys, um, especially because. All right, I think we're on break. I'm going to turn off the mic. Hey, gang, welcome back to the home stretch of the True Well Show. Just a few minutes left. And again, if you're joining us late, you know, that's cool. Grab the podcast. We'll post it in the next day or so um, at littlejohnfs.com, and you can get caught up on all the shenanigans here. Yeah. But um, so, Matt, wh what's what's the summary today? Like think, uh, the shot heard around the world? Yeah, and I think one of the big takeaways was uh, the stock market didn't react nearly quite like a lot of people thought that it would. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously we're still mourning those that, you know, lost their life in the event and stuff. Um, and it was pretty tragic to watch. But um, our, our takeaways from this were trying to look at, you know, what type of impact does this have on the market? And then kind of looking forward to say, okay, well, what if Trump does win the election? What could that hold for the stock market? And it might not be as radical as a lot of people think. Mm -hmm. um, there might be some sectors that thrive, maybe some that have a little bit of a, a pullback. Uh, it remains to be seen. The best we can do is guess um, well, and I, make educated guesses. Let, me, let yeah. me throw something out there for everybody to consider. What if the presidency was less impactful to your investments than you think? That's where my mind's at. Okay. Yeah. You know, here's a couple of key data points. And by the way, if, if you're interested in this stuff, I'd also encourage you to go to our website and get onto our mailing list because we send out sort of updates and things like this a lot. So we're about to send one out to just give some perspective on like the markets at large, how they've been kind of driven by just a handful of stocks lately. Diversification has seemed less en vogue, but it seems to be returning as we speak. Mm -hmm. Lots of stuff like that. But um, I will tell you that it, the jury's still out, but largely speaking, when the company, the the country spends money on a credit card, the market goes up. That happens in both Republican and Democrat regimes. Yep. Okay? And so it's it, there's not a huge causal link between political party and your investment success. Uh, if we were reading the tea leaves right now, I'm not making an investment or a guarantee, but it, it sure looks like there's wind in, in the sails of this market. And there, there may continue to be because the government's going to keep spending and because to the extent that we can make the books look good, everybody wants to try to convince people the economy's in pretty good shape. That's why you need to keep us in office. Right. Right. And, and the other party's going to try to throw rocks, but they would really like the economy good so that they can show up and take credit for it. Mm -hmm. Right. Because we tend to have short memories as voters. So I think in the end, um, once we get past this election, then we can figure out what the market's really going to look at. Yeah. But right now. We're all going to kind of wonder if there's going to be a major change in policy. And the good news is, I think the Fed's going to be relatively silent. And if that's the case, that is generally a good sign for the markets that we can price in at least the next few months of just business as. Yeah. So I think that's the main takeaway, right? And, and I if, think you, that's fair. if you want to know how that works in your world, Give us a call. In the last few seconds, Matt, how do they reach us? 541-375-0898. All right. Well, until next time, I'm Dave Littlejohn. And Matt Dixon. You have listened to True Wealth on News Radio 1240 KQEN. And 93.9. That's the one, yeah. All right. We'll catch you next time.